Great. Welcome, everyone. I'll call the meeting to order of the Bennington Board of Education at 6 4 p.m. on March 11th. Welcome. So, this is the The weather is changing, and we're mostly after students getting the graduation requirements. So that's good. Welcome. We're glad to have you here. Um, we're going to begin our meeting this evening with these pledge of allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Our meetings are governed by the draft the Open Meetings Act, a copy of which is posted on the south wall. Um, Jody is an uh, insurance we have published and done the proper notification, so thank you for that. And we'll begin our meeting this evening as we always do with our public comments. So there should be gold colored papers on the back corner of the table for anyone wishing to speak to the board. Just a couple of items to consider. We allow five minutes per person to discuss with the board any topics that are of concern to you. Our one requirement is we do not engage in discussions on specific personnel or students. And so if you have those kinds of topics, please hold those off and speak to the administration or board member after the meeting this evening. Um, if you if you're going to speak before the board, the sheets need to be turned into Jody here at the front. So if there's any additional sheets, please bring them forward now. And then what we're going to do is have you come forward to the table here, um, state your name, and um, if you're a Bennington resident, if you want to share your address, that would be great. And then we will allow you your time. Now, typically, the board is, does not discuss uh, topics with public comments. So if this is our time to listen to you all. If there are qualified items, the administration will be happy to get back to you in the next couple of days. So with that, we will begin with Rich Carlson. Thank you, Rich. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you. My name is Rich Carlson. Um, address 10420 North 189th Avenue, Bennington, Nebraska 68007. I feel tonight is a night of compliments. The board is dedicated. They don't have any monetary value given to them at all, except for the feeling in their heart that they've done. And they've really done good. And the board we've elected this last two and a half, one and a half, whatever it was it is, we've got a real good board. And I think you've done everything really excellent. I have no criticism whatsoever. Next of all, I want to, I mean, I don't, you know, I've always said what I think at this board meeting, and you know, if you go back and look at some of the stuff on the films in the last two and a half, three years, I've said what I, what I tried to do it sincerely, and I pray to God first that I don't say it wrong and don't hurt anybody's feelings. But I really want to congratulate you folks. Second of all, I want to thank the administration. And I mean everybody in the administration, everybody at the top and bottom, and I want to thank all the teachers. We got one of the best school districts there are. And it's been from hard work, and a lot of that credit goes to our last superintendents that have done a good job. And we've had a few little rough spells here and there, and that's to be expected in life. But I want to give the superintendent, the assistant superintendents, all of them. You don't go to a mail order catalog and order a doctor's degree. It's a hell of a lot of work. And so I compliment him very much. The third thing I would like to say is I was fortunate enough to go to one of the meetings before it was introduced to the public. And they explained things to us, and we got to do a little feedback. And I read that thing, and I don't read good because I can't even recite the alphabet. I don't ever think I'm stupid either. And I read it from forward, backward, and turned it around like a pretzel and read it. And it was all positive to me. And I really appreciate it. And from that day on, every day I pray to the Lord. And if, and if, you, if you get in trouble for saying God or the Lord at the school board meeting, I think a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a file in it. Because I ain't going to ever refuse saying the Lord. So I just pray that this thing passes and you people get to receive the compliments with a plus vote. And then next of all, down the road, I kind of like to see a, didn't they used to call it baccalaureate when I went back to school when the pastors used to come in and have a little prayer? I mean, you know, we can't go this day and age what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. And I thank you for your time. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard. 
Next is Carol Peoples Welcome, Carol, thank you for being here this evening. Well, I think we have a good school group too, but I don't know if my son come off the place. I have some questions though, so <laughs> I'm just going to ask. When I, I try and look at the, uh, the agenda when I come in, and I'm always, because I, I'll say I'm a numbers person, um, I look at the bills and every, they're always approved, and I have no reason to believe that there's something that we're paying that we shouldn't be. But when I look and I go, oh, I wonder what that's for. I wonder what that's for. So I would love to see when we are like going over the bills, like pick a few items out that make sense, or, or that might not be as apparent to the public as they are to somebody else. Because I feel like I, I've been here a few times, and I, but I still don't know. Like for instance, Nebraska Pediatric Practice, or on to college, or Verco, or um, access systems leasing, you know, for ten, twenty thousand dollars. I don't know what those things are, so that would be helpful for me sitting in the audience just to see that kind of stuff. Or if there's something unusual, like for TV, like nutrition services account, we paid MMC mechanical contractors, or the activity fund, we paid housemen. Those things seem to like strike out at me, and so hearing an explanation of some of that, I'm sure it's a great one. I just don't know what it is looking from the outside. Um, and then I noticed that we're switching to iPads, and I don't remember it, but it could have happened at a meeting. What's the cost of us switching from, from uh, I'll say, a, a, you know, a Dell or an IHP or whatever, you know, to iPads, to the Macs? I'm just curious, what it, is there an additional cost, or is it a wash, or what? Because I know the kids have Chromebooks, so that would be different than what the kids are using. Um, so I was just curious. And then on the interlocal agreement, Again, I don't know how those work, but I have heard people um, over, I'll just say, the last year that have said, oh, can we ever get the developers to put in money? And, and yes, the school has to pay for some of that development, but how is it determined, like how much the school pays and how much that developer should pay? Because obviously, if they have a school in their housing area, I would think that would help them sell homes better. I don't, I can't, don't know how it works, just a curiosity for me. Um, and then the last one is the, the CP. Let's see if I can say the alphabet. Amplify CKLA implementation update. I'm thinking that's our recent purchase. I think it was, if my, again, I'm going to memory, eight or nine hundred thousand. And the one thing I, a couple things I remember when that was that the board didn't have to approve that purchase. And I'm just trying to remember if that was right. That the way our policies are written, that that could just occur. Um, and I don't remember there being any negatives, but obviously there's some, some things in there that. The presentation says aren't so good. So now that we know those, or maybe we knew them up front and I just don't remember them, but what are we doing now about those? Because we put out a lot of money for that. And if we have future curriculum things, does the board have to approve that, or is that just okay? Because it seems like that was a lot of money. If I get on there, on the purchases, sometimes I see, you know, $20 items, and that's getting approved by the board. So that seems like a discrepancy. So just my curiosity. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Is there anybody else that walked in late that would like to participate in public forum this evening? All right. The next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. This includes approving the agenda, the minutes from our February 12th regular board meeting, uh, presentation of our March bill for approval of payment, as well as personal resignations and hirings. Steve, you and I have bills this evening, bill review. Um, so I just wanted to mention, I know um, for the board said that we did approve the full ball and the high jump bids. All of that was actually purchased and that came through this month. Um, and then I did write down all of them fast enough up front, Carol, but I can comment on a couple of them. On the college is the ACC prep course that we pay for for our juniors to access these things are copying services. I'm going out on a little here time to go for it, superintendent, to check with me. But those are the two that I, okay, good. We've got a, a time on my hair, so. Um, uh, Carol, we'll get back to you on a couple of those items. Um, Steve, did you have anything else you want to mention on, on the bill review? As a matter of fact, I did have a question on the, uh, the compromise bill review. So, um, one of the questions that I did have so, we have copied printer usage under the Act of And so, on the, obviously, at least for the big questions, the copied printer usage would include both paper and so the lease agreement is not just for the uh, copiers and the printers. It also has a set number of print jobs that it would do. 
And so um, within that, I'm just going to make the numbers, so bear with me. It'll say that we get, whatever, 2 million prints throughout the course of the year. And then they analyze those quarterly and then tell us that we go over that amount as well. And so that's something that we look at internally to see, you know, do we have certain buildings that are going to go over, or certain individuals that are utilizing too much. And so the lease is both the machines and the set number of print jobs. You actually want to go over, but fairly, <laughs> because if you go under it, then you didn't you can pay for copies that you didn't use. And so um, when that was set up and how it was put together, I don't know if they intentionally tried to be lower than what our, our needs were or if it's the growth, but um, what you're seeing is the overages beyond that lease agreement. And so, okay. So there's roughly 8,000 in overage. Yes, that's probably a quarterly. That was about 35,000 over between the four quarters last year. And I think we're on pace for about the same over this year. Yep. And then one of the other bills, so having five cases. So would we be would that paper be used for that specific purpose or are we using that for something if we're ordering five cases it's probably a specialty paper certain color certain stock whatever that is yep generally white paper we order in big pallets in the beginning of the year and then they sit in the warehouse and then get distributed to buildings as needed that way it can be cheaper um, another one that i learned today so the rhythm metronome is the so thank you for telling me how to pronounce that uh, today. But uh, it came up with like $400. And I'm like, those are usually like $15. Quick stuff. But we bought 25 of them. And when you get that, so that's why that number looks, looks out there. I did have a question along these hobbies, though. Where do we find this? I might have missed something that. We bought like $300 worth of lots of hobbies. Yeah, so we have those in the warehouse. Yeah, they are in the warehouse. Yeah, we have them in the warehouse. Yeah, we have them in the warehouse. So we uh, bought some walkie copies for the special education department. Um, kind of keeping in mind the walkie copies that go throughout the district. Those are a, a more hefty duty, have a lot of programming behind them, a lot of service behind them. Our special education programs, so really don't need quite as much uh, of that program behind them. So we need some basic walkie copies. But what we're looking for is just being able to outfit our special education teachers and paraprofessionals with walkie copies so they can call for help if they need a little assistance for. A student might be having a, a health concern or something like that when they're off in the building. They can call the special education team to come help them, or they can call back to the, the office and have uh, the crisis team uh, respond. But it was a more cost effective way of getting everybody outfitted with those rather than just a few key people with the, the larger, more expensive devices that are for the district. And so there's a lot of people reach. Yeah. We, uh, we have those. Uh, I believe Rob and his team did some testing. Um, and it won't reach district right, it'll just reach within the building. That's what we're looking for. And so their idea is if they're on a playground, they can call back and we'll have one of the walkies sit next to the, the secretary that we can call on the big walkies that can go to the front and start walking to it. Thank you so much. Um, I have the other things. So, one of the other, and I think some of these questions have been answered, but this is my response. Um, so it's my understanding that teachers have a, a budget that they can spend, right? So, um, so I just saw some things like um, some chairs, and I'm just thinking that that should come out of a different budget that was explained to me. So um, I did have a question that I don't know, it's not been answered yet. So there was a group of purchases that had to do with like mini refrigerators, there's like three mini fridges for like six options. Um, there's four Bluetooth uh, speakers and a s'mores, electric s'mores thing, and a popcorn. So I didn't know if that was a party. Um, that's the last thing you saw for those things that we have are uh, tough. For each of our hexers, so every hexer we have a hexer oh. assembly, and those are some of the items items for our PBIS initiatives that we're using. And so we're purchasing those items and then doing raffles for students um, for our hexer end of the year hexer assemblies. Okay, I thought so. I thought it was either a party or some kind of giveaway or something. A fun list to give you. <laughs> <laughs> so other than the goldfish uh, cheese crackers, that's all I really had in there. So I appreciate that. Everything else is. All right, is there a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Tim. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Is 
Can you call the roll? Chrissy? Yes. Kara? Yes. Steve? Yes. Allison? Yes. Tim? Yes. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda this evening are reports and presentations to the board, and we'll start with our elementary report. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Good evening. How are you? Uh, Chad Boyce, 8 Point Elementary Principal. Uh, I'm going to step away from the uh, agenda or the, uh, the board report just because you guys, I'm sure, look at the numbers and stuff. And I really want to kind of take it where uh, Rich took it in a positive direction. Just thank a couple groups of people. Uh, first group is our librarians. Uh, the last couple of weeks we've celebrated Read Across America Week. Uh, from those on, those on the outside, it seems like some great dress up days and maybe some cool themes. Uh, but it's a lot of work, and um, our librarians do a great job of supporting all of our kids through the, the Read Across America Week and everything else they do. Uh, so I do want to uh, publicly put that out there. And then the other one is, um, it's going to make it sound like we are celebrating in elementary this uh, last couple of weeks, but it's Teacher Appreciation Week that, uh, these, these uh, next couple of weeks. So uh, thank you to our PTOs. They make our teachers feel so uh, special and appreciated. We talk about teacher retention. We talk about keeping teachers in Bennington, especially um, the ones that we have here now that make our district such a great place and growing that. So um, it's those kinds of things that really make our teachers feel appreciated. So uh, I do want to say thank you to the media specialists and thank you to the PTO. Um, are there any questions for me tonight? All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, uh, Bennington South Middle School. Welcome back. <laughs> Luke Southbeck, principal at Bennington South Middle School. Um, February was a busy month for the middle schools. We held our student-led conferences. Um, thank you to students and parents um, for coming out to visit our building again. Um, to piggyback kind of off of our numbers, you know, we felt um, have had great success implementing something similar to the high school with our success list that's sent out to families every Monday. That's been a good uh, resource as far as late missing assignments and helping students stay on top. Um, and that's something we look to continue for next year as well. A um, couple of highlights from February. Um, one, recognizing Faber Masso as the Douglas County Spelling Bee. Uh, Bennington South building a pretty strong reputation in the area of Spelling Bee. We're back to back Douglas County Spelling Bee champion. So, very excited and happy for her as she competed this weekend at the state Spelling Bee. Um, some items not on that list. I uh, wanted to recognize we are we concluded in February our girls basketball and uh, boys wrestling season. Our eighth grade girls finished third in the EMC, so very proud of that group. Um, they've had back to back really strong seasons and excited to see what they do at the high school level. And then in February, um, at the end of the month, we had a dual wrestling tournament for our boys team. The first time we had put on any kind of event like that at the middle school. And that went off with a big success. So thanks to all of our workers. Um, and then to echo what Mr. Boyce had shared um, with staff appreciation, um, we do want to thank our PTO and families for recognizing the hard work that our staffs do. I'm very excited to see them um, treated um, and throughout the month. And so it's been a, a good time for the month of March and as we continue on to, to finish strong the last answers. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. High school, Dr. Good evening, Greg Lambert, Bennington High School principal. Um, spring musical this weekend, so we're kind of transitioning out of the, the successful fall or winter season. I was wrestling and basketball, cheer and dance, and we actually, I think we actually have soccer scrimmages going on right now. So um, the overlap is, is quite real. But there are performances Friday night for the musical, 7 o'clock, Saturday night, 7 o'clock, and then performances on Sunday at 1 and 5. Uh, another event that we held uh, last week, we had a great registration night. So 318 middle school families, we saw about 240 of those families and kind of explained registration, scheduling to them, graduation requirements, those types of things. And our counselors are, are uh, working hard to get everybody rounded up, get things put in so we can start building the, uh, the master schedule. Um, the only other thing that I would like to mention um, state speech. Uh, we still have that coming up. We had six students qualify this past weekend, so they'll compete in, um, I believe it's March 20th out of Kearney and represent Bennington High School in, in the state speech class A 
division. Um, so I know that gets bandied about a lot. And just um, we do have programs that are that are up in that top class. So um, last one is just an admission of guilt. Um, uh, Mrs. Cerny uh, referenced uh, Virco, and I think Dr. Blumenkamp might uh, might out me on it. So I'll just out myself. That is our payment. Um, for the health classroom furniture. So we have the health classroom renovation going on that is completed. So I believe that payment is the chairs, the tables uh, to outfit that room that they were, ne they were necessary, I promise. <laughs> Questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to student services. Um, Mr. Hamilton, you're Hello again. I'm student services. I uh, just want to kind of pull up a couple of numbers here for you. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is these. This is our projected weights and measures. We uh, we do a, a weighting system that um, talks about how much service a student needs to fill their special education programming. Uh, that is on a scale of one to four, depending on the level of need there. Uh, we do that every year, several times a year, and check on these numbers to see where we're at. We always like to say uh, we have a target of, of 24. That is at the beginning of a conversation. That isn't like a firm number. There's always some room around that kind of talk about some nuances and things about any particular case. So, uh, a few pieces about the, the numbers you might be interested in. Most of our weights are in, in a parameter that's not too, that's looking pretty okay. Uh, the numbers at Bellevue uh, Bennington Elementary, um, those look a little out of whack. We had a position still open that we weren't able to fill last year as we came into this year. So we supported that with paraprofessional support to kind of offset that, that need there. That's been filled for next year, so we should be looking a little better condition for next year. Uh, you'll also notice at high school, we uh, had a position open this year that um, for the, the services there. Uh, kind of keep in mind that we would have filled that position. The 23 probably wouldn't have changed that much. Uh, but as we move into next year, we filled that position, and we're still looking at that caseload weight uh, increasing just due to the numbers that are falling up in the high school as, as our uh, kind of that all that movement in and kind of ages up. So um, a couple other pieces I wanted to point out. Uh, Bennington Middle School, they are working on some of the career exploration pieces. I think that's an important part for them to get started early and talk about careers often as they get older just for the exposure and things. I think they'll have that throughout middle school and high school, which is a wonderful uh, piece that the district talks about and offers. And then finally, on the nursing, uh, you know, they were out finally have the next year. They still have the dental and vision screening that they, they go through. So once they get that down, that should wrap up their screening system. Any questions? Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you got to know I think you're up next with operations. Okay. Um, to piggyback off of Dr. Lambert, the Virco portion of the athletic training room and, uh, uh, and health classroom uh, was the furniture portion of the pictures that you see there. On the left hand side, it's the health classroom. On the right hand side, it's the <coughs> training room. The Hausman Bill was the actual construction or demo. demo, demo renovation of those two classrooms around those two areas and so that's the that's the two bills there uh, so hopefully that answers that question but again you can see we are finally done we've talked about this since uh, august other than the two electrical outlets we're going to add in that health classroom uh, we are done we are up and running uh, classes going on uh, in the health classroom uh, hour by hour and the athletic training room uh, is being utilized by our uh, tail end of our winter athletic season and to start our spring athletic season as well so I uh, appreciate all the help with that, and, and um, I think it's a good area, a good spot for our kids uh, to be able to, to expand a little bit in a building that's, that's pretty pretty crunched, so thank you. Uh, we scroll down, um, second to last paragraph there, uh, we did have uh, a district safety and security meeting. Our third meeting of the year here was on Wednesday, February 28th. One of the main things we talked about um, during Dr. Plaza and I's presentations on the bond issue over the last four months, one of the things that came up was just alternative ways of paying for things. And one of the things we talked about was that security film that would go on the glass uh, of, of our front vestibules, front entryways. Um, the Nebraska Department of Education through the state legislature had a $10 million grant opportunity here in the last six or eight weeks come available 
Um, Mr. Ackman and I are working on that grant right now, and that security film is part of the grant that we are writing. And so we work with uh, some local vendors to get some, some bids on that, so we would be able to include that into our grant. One of the other things we're looking at is some fencing uh, around some of our playground areas at our elementary schools. Uh, it's a $10 million grant. It sounds like a lot, but it's uh, all 240 school districts in the state of Nebraska are eligible to apply for that. And, um, from what I've heard, there are quite a few schools that are applying. So we'll do our best, and we will get that submitted here this week on the 14th, and we'll know by the first week of April whether we receive any of that money. So those are kind of the two main areas that I want to talk about uh, this evening. Any questions that I can answer? That grant is shared by all the school districts, or one school district is no, it's shared. So that's why you could get a million dollars if you get fifty dollars. You could get no dollars. Sure. Yep. 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 Now, a lot of the things that were written into the grant that um, they were looking into is technology, safety equipment, cameras, feeding kids, door locks, things like that. Um, so we felt like um, structural uh, safety procedures is something that fit into that. We felt like that the last film fit right into what we what we need here in Bennington, and so. It's something we can do I do have a quick question just to clarify. Sure. So when we paid uh Houseman, was that out of the activity fund or out of the special building? So it was out of the facility use line item, which is in the activities fund. So yes, we paid for that out of there. And that's um uh when we brought that uh, to the board here earlier in the year. Um work through that uh, work through that fund as well. Thank you so much. Other questions? Thank you. Good evening. Dee Hovey, Assistant Superintendent for CIA. I'm a highlight assessment. Uh, we are coming up on uh, testing season for the spring. Uh, starting April 1st, we have state testing windows. So our third through eighth graders and our 11th graders will all be participating in state testing. Our third uh, through eighth grade take math and reading tests. Uh, fifth and eighth graders also participate in science testing as well. Our 11th graders participate in the ACT, which is a state adopted um, measurement uh, for our high school students. And they take reading, writing, math, uh, English, as well as writing. And they'll do that on Tuesday, April 9th. And that's when our early out days, so that we can build that schedule to fit what's going on. On that same date, our 10th graders will participate in the pre-ACT, and our freshmen will have activities through that day. Our seniors are involved in college visits or finishing up their three C's to meet their graduation requirements. So a busy time starting April 1st, runs through that first week in May, uh, but it's a great time to, to celebrate the work that our kids have done all year to show what they've learned and can do. So um, then we've gotten going on summer school plans as well. Um, we are already starting to invite students to our elementary summer school and working with our middle school as well. Uh, we offer summer school for kids in kindergarten through eighth grade. And then in high school, we have programs for credit recovery so that you can keep kids on track to graduate on time. So uh, our elementary is focused on the Olympics. We're gonna have an Olympic theme uh, this summer and our middle school is to the moon. And they're gonna do some other space themes and study some science along with their reading and math. Any questions I can answer for you tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Are you about to pause when I get us your superintendent's report? Yeah, I wish I had a fun theme like summer school, but I do not. We talked more in budget. Uh, we'll start with uh, just a little bit of a budget update. We are now six months through the fiscal year. And so uh, as we've done in the past, kind of broke down our expenses into two categories, payroll and accounts payable. Payroll is everything that has to do with humans. So it's your salary, it's your FICA, it's your insurance, everything that would be tied to that employee. Uh, accounts payable is everything that's not tied to employees. So those would be contracts, it would be electricity, it would be maintenance, all of those other items. And, um, so what we did is we did an analysis of the last five years to determine what percentage of our budget had we expended through six fiscal months. It's not exactly a huge thing. Uh, payroll is actually pretty close to its half. 
we do have some employees that don't work during the summer. And so, um, you know, it's not exactly 50% of the year or half of the year. Accounts payable, we have some big bills we pay early in the fiscal year, some we pay late in the fiscal year. And so I uh, took an average of the last five years and just predicted out to see where we're at. We did make this a little more nuanced. It's not exactly just the perfect percentage, but um, we did analyze to make sure that it was going to be fairly accurate. Um, as of right now, uh, payroll is forecasting out to be just over $40 million, which is just about $200,000 over um, what we anticipated in August when the budget was adopted. On the accounts payable side, we are significantly under what we anticipated. We're right at $5 million in expenses. Uh, we've traditionally been about 45.8% of our total budget at this point in the year, um, which moves that to about 10 million, 10.8 million, which puts us about a million dollars under what we anticipated at the start of the year. Now, we can have another tractor that catches on fire. We have, you know, whatever else can happen with the HVAC system. That number changes in a quick hurry. But as of today, uh, we'd be about a million dollars under budget. Um, all in, uh, we are about $800,000 under what we anticipated the end of August. I've done this for years, and what I've found out is this is really inaccurate-ish halfway through the year. You get to May at the nine month, it gets pretty darn accurate. And so um, it's a way for us to make sure that there's nothing that's way out of whack or just looks completely different to what we expected. Um, but then once we get to the, the end of the third quarter in May, it really gets pretty tight. And so I'll bring that back to you at that time as well. Questions on that? All right, next one's kind of the same uh, type of uh, concept, and that's our kindergarten members. And this is a new analysis um, that the district hasn't really done in the past, but you know, it's really hard as we're going through these personnel proposals. How many kindergartners do we have next year? And until they register, we don't actually know. And so um, we know how many have registered every month. And there was a question on that last um, last meeting as well. And so Jody is very kind and went through the last five years and looked at every building and how many kindergartners have registered in January, how many registered in February, how many registered in March, and went all the way across with every, um, every building that we have. We then analyzed over the last five years what percentage of that building registered by the end of February compared to the final number. And then we looked at each week because they're all different. And I just something I didn't know. Um, Pine Creek typically registers pretty fast. Heritage registers pretty slow. They kind of have their own mini, you know, ways of doing things. And so what you can see is our registrations through March 1 in each of the buildings, what uh, percentage of total registrations have been the average after January, February for each of the last five years, the average of the averages. Uh, we multiply those out and it gives us an estimate at the end of for kindergarten for the upcoming year. And so that would be the right column of, as of March 1, what do we anticipate our kindergarten numbers are going to be for next year. Um, at the beginning, or several months back, when we were talking about potential for this year, we put the number at 350 in kindergarten. So as of today, I'll tell you, we're within three of what we anticipate. A reminder, when we said 350, it did trigger adding a kindergarten position. But we didn't want to do that until we felt a little bit more confident. If it was today, it's still showing that that is a possibility. If you look at it by building, one building subtracts one, one building adds one, and then a second building adds one. So it would trigger out exactly like our trigger said. Um, again, don't want to jump the gun on that though, because there's still 64 to 78% historically of what that, those averages would be. So we want to wait till the end of March before we start to make any real decisions for the kindergarten for the upcoming year. The numbers have shown at the end of March is about 85% complete, so we can feel a little bit more confident where we're at. Um, from that March 1 to today, we've had 15 more kindergartners, kindergartners registered. The last five years, we've averaged 36. Almost exactly on pace for what the average has been. Um, the one positive of that is Pine Creek has only had one because that's the one that we're looking at going, oh no, this is, might, we're going to figure this one out. And so only one of those 15 has come from Pine Creek. And so uh, we'll feel more confident here in a few weeks uh, as we forecast that out. Questions on how that worked or how that was put together? You answered my question because I was going to ask you about Pine Creek and the number. So. Yeah, that's the one every time the registration comes in, which building, hopefully not that one. Um, all right. And then the last thing I have is just the final day of school, just a reminder of where we're at. I think standard practice in the district has been, 
I don't know exactly if we do a parade or a board vote or what, but we have to announce when the last day of school is. Um, we set up a little bit different system this year with the two snow days for, uh, for students. And so assuming that we are done with snow days and the second one is, or the third one is the last one that we have, the last day for students will be on May 22nd. May 22nd, assuming no more snow days. If we have a snow day tomorrow, it's going to be May 23rd, but we're hoping as of March 11th, we're done with those. And, uh, May 22nd is the last day for students. Thank you. If you want to do a parade, we can. <laughs> no parade here. Take recommendations. Okay. Um, I think the next item uh, for us to discuss is the committee reports. I don't believe the Building and Finance Committee has met. It's been uh, heavy on the meeting, but on the front of the end of the school year. So um, the curriculum committee did meet. If you could pull up those minutes and then. Something in the curriculum, so you want to comment briefly? Yeah. This is not your meeting you had this before this. I don't think those have been touched up. So, yeah, we were just continuing to look at those, the, the lower budget items to consider um, at that time. And you can put some forth, I believe. Are we not going to <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't really probably fair. But no, that's totally fine. Totally I think we, we did talk about the therapy hub implementation, yes. right? We did yeah. that. Um, and well, we did that. So we we're still working with a work in progress on the library uh, procedure manual. So we're working on that as well. Uh, we're also looking at um, time frames as far as our material, material for book challenges and how often we're going to do those. And uh, how many times we're going to allow that to happen within that time period? I think those were really, I would say that's the majority of what we discussed. So. Okay. And then I have a report on the policy committee at CC and Paloza. Um, we met last week, we reviewed. Um, so I think one of the initiatives we had started, I think, a year ago, January, was to really do a more regular review of our policies. So we developed a schedule, thanks to Jody, for mapping out for us to make sure we get through all the policies in time. And Dr. Potts, thank you for assisting with that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're ahead of schedule. We um, did more of a front end load of the first several sections. So we talked about that. And then we also reviewed um, some potential changes to our instructional material selection policy, and then our policy on media centers. And so um, the committee asked for some additional feedback from the administration. So, Dr. Claus and team are working on that, and then we will reconvene as a policy committee uh, going forward. Good committee, uh, good committee work, so thanks everyone for that. All right, the next item up is Mr. Upman doing our uh, coordinator report this evening on technology. We'll let him uh, make his way up here. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> uh, my name is Rob Luckman. I'm the technology coordinator for the district here. This meeting, typically what we've talked about is kind of our plan for how we move forward with the rest of school year purchases, projects that are coming up, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> so I was trying to introduce my team because nothing I do happens without them. Um, there's a couple of new faces up there. Um, our system administrator was lucky enough he took a director job down at Ralston, so we're going to miss Josh. Curtis Kralichek, who's been with us for almost four years now, um, stepped into that role. So we have two new IT associates, Xavier uh, Ingram, he's uh, at the original middle school and high school. And then Mr. Jake Townsend has joined us, he's at Stratford and ASMS. Uh, one really fun fact, Jake is a former student of ours who's come back to work for us. So. Really happy to have those guys there. They're, they're really fitting in well. So as we move forward, um, you know, since December, I have three new members of the six-man team. So it's been fun. Um, I will try and throw a quote in here. Um, this one's from Steve Jobs. It's not a faith in tech. It's a faith in people. Um, something that we all try to remember. We become so reliant on technology these days, uh, especially in education. It doesn't matter how good the tech is that put in front of you if you don't have the right teachers behind it. it doesn't so I was trying to put something in there. A couple of projects coming up. Um, we have been working to implement what's called Duo. 
it's a multi-factor authentication. This is really coming out of the requirements that we're seeing from our cyber insurance and insurance companies. They're wanting us to have MFA. If you think about when you go on your bank and you get the little pop-up that says, is this you? Um, something very similar. So we're working to implement uh, for our email, by the start of next school year, we will be district-wide with all our employees. Um, right now, we've done the tech team, started with them. We moved the administration on there, and then Mr. Appleback has been kind enough to volunteer in South Middle School. We'll get them rolled in yet this year as well, um, with an anticipation of rolling everything next year. Um, another big piece, uh, we have finalized our new server relocation. If you guys remember last year, we bought a new VM infrastructure. It was time. Um, some of our VM servers are almost 10 years old, um, so we did update all of that. They've all been relocated over to Stratford Elementary. Um, the reason for this is Stratford is the only building in the district that has 24-7 generator backup within those IT closets. So it gives us a little bit of additional um, standby, so if something were to happen, the generator kicks in, we've got battery backups in place in between them. So we should never lose those and have to worry about our server infrastructure crashing down and, and causing issues. So really happy to have that one in there. Um, that's been a big task that's taken a couple of months to get everything by the time you get everything moved around and subnets moved and all the other things that come with that. So that was, that was a big one I'm, I'm happy to have done. Um, one big thing that's coming up um, every year we go out for what's known as E-Rate. E-Rate is a federal funding program. Bennington is eligible for a 40% reimbursement when it comes to E-Rate, so we use it for everything from our internet connection to the outside world to what are known as layer two. So switches, wireless, phone systems, the, uh, I'm sorry, telephones don't fall there. Uh, wireless switches, low voltage cabling, so things like internet <laughs> buildings. Um, the high school is due for replacements in the original and the junior high wings. When we built the G wing or the new wing, uh, those ones were upgraded at that time. So there will be 77 APs that will that went out for bid. Um, so we're we're looking at replacing all 77 of those to bring that up to the same standards that we have in all of our other buildings. Um, those ones are about eight years old, so it's it's time in their life cycle. Um, We'll be going with a combination of the Aruba 510 and the Aruba 530s. We are Aruba across the district, so what makes this really nice is when you go to any one of our buildings, our staff members, they don't have to switch networks and automatically knows who it is. It uses the same certificates. It makes people who travel between buildings really easy. Um, so this will continue for what we've been doing. Um, purchases. Um, looking at a number of purchases this year. So the first two that I'm going to talk about um, these were both ECF grants. Um, at the beginning of the year, you guys, I know I told you that we had gotten a $200,000 roughly $45,000, $50,000 grant um, through ECF, which was Emergency Connectivity Fund from the federal government. Um, this is how those dollars are going to be spent. So we'll have 160 iPads. Those will be going out uh, to K-5 classroom teachers. Um, as we look through this, the new curriculum with Dibbles and M-Class, um, the way that they input those, it's a lot of sounds if you're touching, if you're clicking things in a very quick manner, um, it's a little bit harder with maps. So we've decided we're going to use, because the, there was 160 iPads at the time that we had been for K-1 classrooms, they're not being used, is what we're talking about. We've done research on those just aren't being used in those classrooms the way they used to before COVID. So we're going to shift those over to the K-5 teachers. Um, we're still using those grant dollars. I can't use those grant dollars for anything else because that's how it was bid. So it's either I order the iPads or we just throw the, I think it's roughly $27,000 back to the government. Second part is 918 Chromebooks. Um, again, this grant was written two years ago during COVID. They originally said no, and they came back and said we have some additional funding, so they said yes. Um, so that will cover our 6th grade Chromebooks this year, our ninth grade Chromebooks, and then give us 300 additional new ones to roll down into our elementaries as we continue to go through our life cycle on those. And then finally, uh, we'll have somewhere in the neighborhood 90 to 100 MacBooks for staff replacements and new teachers. Um, this is year three out of four when it comes to the MacBooks in a four-year transition plan. Um, I know there was a couple of questions earlier on about how we made that decision. Uh, so it was based on a couple of things. We looked at the curriculum, we looked at how they were using them in the classroom. 
we actually surveyed our staff to see what the their opinion was. Um, there was almost a 67 percent um, of our staff that preferred Mac over PCs. The cost for us as a district is actually less. Um, it actually takes less people to run a Mac shop than it does a Windows shop because of how they do software updates, deploy software, all of those things. Um, and then we also compare the price of the actual units. For us, we have always done a touchscreen uh, Windows laptop. The, when we first started, when I first started here six years ago, they were running about $1,100. By the time COVID came around, they were anywhere from $1,300 to $1,700 a unit. The max we're buying for, I believe this year, $829. So there's a pretty substantial cost difference for the district. And they have higher resale value when you, get, when you would go to transition them off. So a number of things that came into play on those, but those are those are why we made those decisions. Um, the other part, we're looking at 25 Mac minis. Everything Middle School's computer lab is due for a refresh. Um, those ones are almost as old as that building. Um, so it's time in order for them to keep up with the curriculum they're using with the Adobe software and other things. It's time we did do a transition last year, if you remember, for Paul Wright's lab of the high school. Um, testing goes out. We have had almost zero problems in that entire lab over here. So we're going to continue that model at BMS this following year. End of the year, uh, this becomes a very busy time in my world. Uh, so every year we collect all of the Chromebooks from um, 12th grade and 8th graders. 8th graders, if they're doing summer school, they will hold on to those until they're done with summer school. But seniors and 8th graders, we turn those in, we refresh them, we recycle them down to elementary as part of our life cycle. So if you remember, 8th grade, or 6th or 8th grade, they go for three years in our one-to-one. -one. Then they go four years at our high school. After they're done there, we have about six years where those Chromebooks will pull updates, refresh, do everything we need them to. So they'll cycle back down to the elementary and the carts, they don't get quite as much use, they're not carried at home, um, and we use them kind of in surplus. So if you think about it, you know, we may roll down a few more, but we'll use those to replace ones that are no longer in the warranty and the ammunition. Um, that way we still get a good one. The other part of that, we will transition this year all of our 7400s. Um, so those are the Black Bells, they're up on their five years. So they're coming out of cycle, and then we're working to prepare our summer school rosters, app assignments, clever, and all the things that go along in the summer school. So as I mentioned, this summer, what is on our radar? We'll replace the wireless and VHS. So those ones, we, the APs come to us, we do all the programming, we do all the installation on those. Um, we'll prepare somewhere in that 90 to 100 new devices for staff members. Um, some of those will go out before the end of the year. If you're Dell is going to replace this year, we're going to do that before you leave in May. That way you have all summer to transition on the new machine. New teachers uh, will get their devices July 17th and 18th. Those will be the new staff days. We'll have boot camps, um, which are both tech and um, integration based on how to teach in the classroom. And then we'll also be replacing that lab at that time as well. So, a little bit of highlight, Mackenzie White, who is our tech integration specialist. She falls as shared between both me and Dr. Hoagie. I'll try and highlight a little bit of what she's done. So last year, one of the things we did, we had her uh, set of meetings with all new teachers, all first year teachers, to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, tech consults with them. Right now, she's at 94% of all of our new teachers have got their stuff scheduled and meetings and, and are continuing to work on projects. We had a really big fifth grade social studies unit that she's helped to revise in collaboration with that team across all five of our buildings. Um, they've been working with Google Earth and Google Sites. Um, she helped co-teach it with Pine Creek and Bennington Elementary second semester. And then library media specialist, uh, she's been working with them on a collaboration to earn and build district digital citizenship recognition. Uh, we're working with um, a company to actually get registered as, or recognized as a district. Um, it's Common Sense Education. It's one of the top ones that you'll see across the state. Um, it's pretty standard. Um, right now, the, all of the library media specialists are working on getting their certification, and then once they get them, they'll work on school certifications. I believe we have two librarians who've already got it. 
one building that already has it, we have to hit 60% to get um, registered as a district. So um, some of the things that we have coming. Um, a lot of information, not a real lot, a lot of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys have. Do have any questions? Thank you for all the work. Yeah. <laughs> 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 one, one quick, uh, that you can hear. All of those purchases will come back to you at next month's meeting. So if you have any questions, any questions between now and next month, let us know. And, uh, we'll next month. Thank you. Next up is Dr. Mitchell with our um, Amplify CKLA um, implementation update. Good evening, Shannon Tindall, Assistant Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. And like Allison said, um, I'm presenting on Amplify CKLA. Um, it is our K through 5 ELA curriculum. First, I want to highlight the process we went through last year and that we go through with every uh, curriculum selection process. Um, first, we do a review of our current programming, um, our Old Wonders program. We look at the strengths and areas for improvement. And then we look at Rule 10 and the expectations of Nebraska and the standards that they have set for ELA in the elementary. We also look at national expectations, the research nationally, and what professional organizations are finding that it's evidence-based and that works for kids when they are in reading instruction. Then we go through a needs analysis um, of what does our current trend say? How are our kids performing? Um, what do our teachers say about our current curriculum? And that takes all about six months. Five to six months is the beginning process, really looking where we want to go with our next curriculum selection. And then at that point, we review our mission, purpose, and beliefs when we're teaching ELA. And we recommend changes to our mission and purpose based on the standards, um, what are national trends, what does the research say, and what have we learned from past instruction and our student performance. We make those recommendations for changes to our belief statements, and then we finally, about in, after the beginning of the year, we begin to review and evaluate potential instructional materials. And then we recommend instructional materials for adoption, and then finally, we finalize the selection and negotiate purchase. So this was a year-long process that we go through, that we go through with any curriculum that we're going to adopt. And so through this process, we came up with our vision statement. And what our vision statement said is we want an explicit, systematic way of teaching ELA that's based on research and that it has the essential components of foundations of reading, reading comprehension, writing vocabulary, speaking and listening, that in line with the college and career ready standards. And so then we begin to focus on our material selection. We know what our vision is, and we came up with focus areas that we wanted our next potential curriculum to have. The first thing we looked at is high quality instructional materials. We wanted it to meet the needs of all our diverse learners and outline explicit instruction for our teachers. The next thing we wanted evidence-based. We wanted to make sure that it focused on foremost helping all of our students learn. Finally, we looked at programs that were aligned to the Nebraska State Standards and embodied the science of reading, the latest brain research on how kids learn to read. And then we wanted to make sure that it aligned with the science of reading, that aligns with the Nebraska Nebraska state standards, and we wanted to make sure it had a component of word recognition and language comprehension, the two things that are needed for kids to be successful in reading. So after that, how did we design on Amplify CKLA, that alphabet of letters that you were referring to? <laughs> Number one, it had the strongest program for foundational skills. What are foundational skills? Those are the print concepts, phonics, phonological awareness, and fluency. And we wanted explicit instruction in those areas. 
And then we looked at skill integration. We wanted a program that had was inclusive with all ELA instruction. It contains writing, grammar, spelling, and handwriting within that program. <coughs> Where in the past, we had had separate programming and had to buy curriculum for all those separate components. This was all inclusive in Amplify CKLA. I mentioned the explicit instruction piece. We wanted it to be systematic and clearly outlined for our teachers. We wanted to make sure whether you were a first grader in Heritage Elementary or a first grader in Bennington Elementary, you had a guaranteed curriculum and the same opportunities for learning. The next piece, number four that we looked at, was the vertical alignment. We wanted a piece in it that year to year it built on skills and content. <laughs> and then the knowledge that was built and the skills we built would transcend through our system through middle school and high school curriculum courses. Number five, high quality instructional materials. What we know to prepare kids to be college and career ready that they needed exposure to complex and content rich content, content rich text and a program. And finally, college and career ready. Like I mentioned, we wanted to make sure it was aligned to the Nebraska State standards and, and the instructional shifts outlined in the silence of reading. So we knew that this was going to be a heavy lift, that the implementation planning was very important because this was going to be a first, first order change, a large change for our staff. And so we had to be very intentional in implementation. And so what we did is we formed an implementation committee. And what it consisted of, it was about six to seven members of each elementary staff um, a representative of each grade level, a reading specialist, and a special education person. So the committee comprised of about 30 staff members that were currently employed by the Bennington Public Schools. We offered that team um, a pre-training on the components of Amplify CKLA. We had a trainer come out and help us, and they dug into the curriculum, just that small team. And then during the summer, they did planning for implementation during the year. They outlined the curriculum, the assessments, they did lesson planning, um, they talked about resources, and they laid it all out for our staff. We knew the first part of training our staff for this was to train them on the science of reading since it was a shift that the way we had taught in the past. And so our staff had multiple opportunities to attend that required training. Some of them chose to do it during the summer for um, pay for, for attending the summer training. And some of them decided they would much rather do it in back to school days when um, the staff came back. So everybody first was trained in the science. <coughs> and then um, we went back and we brought the Amplify CKLA trainers into our district and they trained the, the teachers on the specific curriculum components and the lesson components and where to find the resources. And then finally, the last step before school ever started, they had back to school grade level meetings and the trainers in the building, our reading specialists, the implementation team work with those grade levels to to help them become comfortable before they are already before they ever started teaching the curriculum. So that was a long process through the summer and before we ever saw kids. The other part of the adoption, and you heard Mr. Ackerman refer to it, was double Dibble's eight. Dibble's eight is an assessment that measures the critical skills necessary for kids to be successful at their grade level. And what it is, is it's a teacher facing, they work one-on-one -on -one with kids, and it contains a short one-minute measures that use for universal screening of kids that might um, be at risk for reading difficulties. It's benchmark assessments to see if kids meet thresholds through the year, and it's progress monitoring. Are kids <coughs> responding to the learning process in the curriculum that we're presenting to them and the lessons? So it's very timely. It identifies kids that are at risk for meeting end-of-year benchmarks. That's why it's a curriculum-based. It is 
This is what a kid needs to learn in fourth grade, and we're going to measure their attainment of those skills to be a successful reader at the end of fourth grade. And it is very timely, like I mentioned, it can be progress monitored. So if a student is having difficulties, we can progress monitor a kid and, and the ones that are at our highest risk. We are suggesting that, that teachers are progress monitoring them every two weeks, and then they're um, targeting the skills that they're showing they're deficient in. So it's very responsive to meet the kids' needs. All right, what you're looking at now is how we're kind of monitoring implementation. And what this is, is this is a Dibbles 8 um, data information graphic, and it compares beginning of the year progress to middle of the year performance levels for each grade level. It's as a district as a whole. So if you look at kindergarten, it categorizes students' performance into four zones. The red is the well below benchmark kids that are performing at well below. The yellow is below benchmark. So the kids at well below are usually below the 20th percentile in their performance. The kids in the yellow are 40th percentile and below. And the green and blue at benchmark and above benchmark are those kids that are hitting 40th percent and above. And so you'll see there's a BOY, which is the beginning of the year measure, and the MOY is the middle of the year measure. So this um, shows our students' progress in the first four months of implementation. And obviously what we want to have happen is our kids to be in the green and blue zone. They're meeting the benchmark or they're above the benchmark for the end of the year thresholds that they want that they need to be successful leaders. Now I want to clarify that these benchmarks increase and become more difficult throughout the year. So in first grade, a student to hit the green zone at benchmark had to score about a 330. By the time that it gets to um, the middle of the year assessment, they had to be almost 50, I think 58 points higher to maintain the green zone. So if kids are staying in the green zone, they're still progressing, those kids that are moving out of the yellow or the red zone and progressing are not only showing um, zones growth, but they're even achieving more because they're moving out of that zone of growth. So this shows kindergarten, first, and second grade. And the next slide shows the third, fourth, and fifth grade. So you can see we're pretty pleased. Do we still have kids in red and yellow? Absolutely. And we think the system, we can dig down into that individual kid, find their targeted areas of deficiency, and offer intervention to address their areas of deficiency. And so, but overall, most of our students are moving into the green and blue zone within the first five months of our curriculum. The red, we have, these kids are at the most risk, and we address them in intensive intervention. They might be kids that have an individual education plan for special education, or they're seeing our reading specialists. They're receiving intervention within the classroom, and then what we call double dip, they're receiving intervention from our reading specialists. The yellow zone, those are the kids that are at some risk, not at high risk, but at some risk to have reading deficiencies at the end of the year, and usually those interventions take place within the classroom, within the small group. All right, another way we have been monitoring implementation is through a, a teacher and leader perceptional survey. What this slide tells us is that we polled our teachers. Um, there was 31 that answered this. We know we have more teachers in K2 than 31, so it was a voluntary response. But we polled our teachers to see their comfort level on the curriculum and delivery within the first semester. You can see the majority of them strongly in agreed. The first one is about the knowledge. There's two pieces for K2. There's a knowledge piece and there is a skills piece that teachers teach. 
the majority of them feel comfortable. Do we want to hit 100%? Absolutely. And I'm going to address that later in the presentation, <coughs> what we're going to continue to do to build that comfort level for these staff members. Now, remember, we consider this a first order change, and change takes time if we know the process. What the research would tell you for a teacher to become confident in a curriculum, it <coughs> takes three years. And so we'll continue to address this as the years go on. This is the third through fifth grade teacher perception. Um, you can see there is less numbers and they strongly agree, but they do, the majority of them do agree. I would say the lift for them was more difficult because of several reasons. The change was greater. Um, there is a morphology piece that the teachers have to, have to now instruct in and it's very scripted and what morphology is is a study of work. Most of the time our younger teachers are K2, we're working on the development of words and the understanding of words, but now that we know this we're, we're stretching it, how important it is to learning to read, we're stretching it to our 3-5 teachers. The other thing is the content is rigorous. It is a very content complex driven curriculum which shows to build kids ability to read more complex and to analyze text that they need for career and college readiness and so we think the heavier lift is here but we do recognize we need to continue to work with our three five teachers to build their confidence in the instruction of MLICPLA. All right, Over, overall trends. We asked, we gave them the option also to put in comments. And so we went through all those comments and looked for their common trends and how teachers were feeling. They admit it's increased rigor, but they think it's good for our kids. They think it will prepare them for the future better. Um, they are very excited that students are showing early reading growth and it's great impact in the first five months. They say students are engaged in the content and the unit topics. We, we frequently see um, teachers going above and beyond, like the Vikings unit, they built in fourth grade, they built ships, and in the doctor's unit, or the health unit, the body systems unit in first grade, they pretended they were doctors and diagnosed and did fun things. So we see the really the teachers engaging in the curriculum because the content is new and they can build upon it. And it has a strand in it that addresses science, um, history, art, and it's not, and it has different selections that are uh, literary based, but then they're also knowledge based. So they're seeing different texts. And so our teachers think that that is helping to engage the students in the, cur the curriculum. Um, one thing, we wanted to be very transparent and we need to support they're spending a lot of time on prep. They don't know the curriculum yet. They don't know the content. So upfront planning is a lot more for them. And then they need support differentiating with the core. Like I told you through in class, we have very clear data on deficiencies for each student. And so now they want to meet those kids' needs. And, and so they want to continue to build um, differentiate, differentiating the curriculum, meeting the individual needs of our students. And then they were very positive that they do believe their confidence and understanding in the curriculum will improve as they use it and get to know it. And so on this slide, I'm not going to read these, but these are just some excerpts of some of the comments that they made and where we took those trends from. And you can see. Some think it's friendly, some think it's time consuming, it's just their comfort level and we need to continue to work on that and support them in implementation. And so with all that being said, we know we have to continue to support and we have some plans for future continuation of implementation support. Um, we're going to have, we have had a mid-year meeting with that implementation team and we have one also scheduled in late April where we'll look and we'll continue to meet with that implementation team and address concerns, what support needs to happen, what questions do you have. Um, we had a second semester training that CPLA came out again and we made it very targeted and personal for grade levels. 
We had a trainer come out for five days that visited <coughs> each school and met with every grade level. So they had individual time. So it might have spent one day at Anchor Point, and it went through and met with kindergarten teams and answered their questions, went through um, to some next semester planning with them, what resources were they missing, where could they find things. Really had a I think I'm dead. I'll talk loud. <laughs> um, really had some good support for them individually. We also had a specific training for our principals and our administrators where um, they were they wanted to be strong instructional leaders and support their staff so they took the time to talk about ways to get feedback and how they can implement their teachers for support we give time for professional collaboration on our layout days so across districts they can talk so there's consistency in implementation but hey you're doing really good on this how did you do this i'm struggling with this what would you recommend so that collaboration was very important this summer, during our curriculum day, we will once again revise our pacing, grading, lessons, or amplify. Um, you know, we adopt a curriculum, but we also make it ours and, and, and make it sure it's meeting our needs and, and, and meeting our philosophy of instruction. And then after those meetings, after all that feedback, we'll determine secondary implementation support and professional learning, what we need to continue to do, and we'll have an intentional plan once again. Okay, that was a lot of information. What questions do you have for me? Um, so I've got uh, a kid in first grade and third grade, so we're pretty heavy into the change, so I yes. appreciate uh, all the information. Um, I know that some of the teachers that we've talked to, specifically for my situation, right, um, they are making some changes and there's some learning curve there, so I appreciate them doing that. Um, one of the things, so when I'm looking at first grade, we go back to the uh, devil's testing in our beginning year and middle of year performance levels. When we're looking at first grade, uh, which I've got a daughter in, mm -hmm. we're looking at 161 students, almost 46% 40, below, uh, or well below. Um, first grade is 140 students, third grade is 139, so almost 140. So when we're looking at that many students, and we carry on into the fourth and fifth, that just seems like a pretty big challenge to get everybody on grade level. Um, yeah. So how, how's that? A absolutely, and and so the red, Steve, the kids in, in, in red, we have really intensive targeted intervention. Like I said, that might be they would go through um, the process of PST, which is a problem solving team, and we would address those deficiencies and we try to plan. Um, if they're usually in that low low benchmark, they qualify for an individual reading improvement plan, which is an I-Red. And so we would target those skills specifically, come up with interventions, and like I said, this system will also progress monitor. So every two weeks, we'll be looking to see if that kid is responding to the intervention. And if they aren't, then we will adjust the intervention. I do agree those numbers look big, um, but I do think with the, the adoption of the curriculum, we will see that decrease one thing we did select Amplify CPLA was based on the foundational skills and the systematic um, teaching of those foundation skills, which we didn't have in the past explicit instruction in phonemic awareness, phonics. We did cover it in our curriculum, but it wasn't as explicit as this. And so something like um, the, the Dibbles 8 does measure that. And so we hope, as we see it, we see it decrease through the years. We do have a plan to address those deficiencies. Okay. And so we do have enough resources for, especially the well below. Um, that just seems like if they're going to do an IREP or, or, or IEP or whatever that case, I mean, it just seems like a lot. Yeah, it, it, it could be a lot right now. The we've got 52 kids yeah. alone just in kindergarten. We've got 74 kids in first grade, 65 
just, I, I mean, I've been through the process, so I just feel like that seems to be quite a bit to me. So. Yeah. So those, are, those are my numbers, but um, we do have reading and specialists in every building, sometimes two, and those are district employees. So if there's one building that um, shows increased numbers in the red, then we would move those, that FTP or those individuals to that building to target that instruction. We're always monitoring that, and we come to you to ask for more reading, instruction, support, special education, teachers based on our student needs. Yeah, summer school, I think, is full. Is it full yeah. or I, I know the younger ones are, there's a waiting list, so I'm yeah. sure. We have to offer summer school to our students that are on reading improvement plans. That is uh, part of the Reading Improvement Act, and so they do get first um, offering to summer school. Um, we are looking, we did increase the numbers of summer school this year to support those kids. So hopefully, and some of them take it, some of them don't. We do have options of summer enrichment programs or stuff they can do at home that we can send home to. Okay. I haven't heard of that part, so. Yeah, yeah. sometimes we, we offer that and, and, and send home packets and enrichment for those kids who who may have interest in summer school but are not able to attend or do not qualify. That's called summer enrichment. Yeah, yes, yeah, yep, yep. It's been sent out the last two years, Dave. Was going to be my question was just what does amplify CKLA CKLA all the letters? Um, <laughs> is there a piece for parents or home? There is. Just throughout the year, or is that just there, is. Okay. there is, and students can access the reading and the materials at home digitally and those will be open in the summer. The other thing we have is, um, oh my gosh, just a blank. Yeah. What was the name of that program? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Clever. Clever. Oh, yeah. Clever. IXL. 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 Thank you. Another alphabet. Thank you. <laughs> they they oh, have IXL. access to IXL and practice those skills through that all summer long, too. <laughs> that's a lot of good questions. Thank yeah. you. All right, next up is our lobbyist report. Did you leave here? Apparently not. I didn't it's see it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to highlight a couple of items, Dr. Claus? We've all had an opportunity to read it. So. Yeah, just a couple of okay. high level stuff. If you don't mind, let's see some of the high level we're talking about here. Um, First thing, I think there are 40 days per day, and they are not. So 40, 41 days through the session. So that's two thirds through the short session. So we're getting down to the end. Um, seeing a lot more um, collaboration between committees and within committees for them to try to figure out what the packages are going to be. Uh, so each committee is bringing out different packages. Um, the speaker has asked that it would be six or less bills in a package. So remember last year's education bill was like 22 or something like that. Um, I have seen some that have more than six, though, so I don't know where that rule is exactly standing or not. Um, but those are starting to come out. You can see the education bills are on there. Uh, nothing that, I'm trying to remember, there's some that greatly impacted us as a district. I don't believe there was anything that was, you know, really impacted anything compared to others. Uh, you can read through what the potential second package would be as well. Um, probably, if you would down, please. Um, Maybe a little more impactful right now is whatever the potential um, uh, property tax savings or how that impacts uh, uh, school funding for next year. Um, what that's going to look like as of today, I have absolutely no idea. Our governor has been pretty public about wanting 40% relief in property taxes. And so the question is that additional money that comes into the schools that we can then pass on to our patrons, uh, is that accompanied with? Um, uh, revenue increase caps or lids or not. Um, those are parts that we just don't know at this point, and they're still working on um, probably more behind closed doors. So one of the proposals that's out there is to limit the revenue that comes in. So a reminder, LB243 that was passed last year, the way that worked was um, it, you get 3%, so your revenue is allowed to go up 3%. So if our state aid goes down 10%, we are allowed to make that up of local property taxes and increase our total revenue by 3%. If our state aid goes up, then we would have to drop our property taxes, so they limit us to 3%. Um, 
There are some caveats to go above that. That's the plus, plus, plus. Um, that's based on EL students, um, students with uh, on free and reduced lunch, and then growth as well. And so growth is a big one for us, obviously, as our district continues to grow at an incredible pace. Our plus in the growth side is significantly more than others. Um, beyond that, let's say, so this year, I think we were like at 8.1 was our total revenue increase we were allowed to have. If the board so shows they could have added an additional 5%, that was a, a board override. Our, we did not do that. We couldn't meet our, our cap if we wanted to because we couldn't generate that much revenue. Uh, but there are talks about eliminating that override. And so that would no longer be within your local control to do that. Um, so I don't know if that'll be part of it or not a part of it, but that's something to keep an eye on here over the next month or so. Um, and then, which I think she talks about in the bottom, that's the educational funding part. Another one that I feel like uh, is probably worth our time talking about is LD878 by Senator Holcroft. This would be eliminating the ability for schools to do um, bond elections or bond issues on special elections. Um, under his current bill, it says that you would only be allowed to run a bond issue on a general election, which would be every two years. And so that does put a school like Bennington in a little bit more unique situation than maybe others that that wouldn't be quite as big of a deal just based on the timing. Um, so having that with Senator Holcroft and others just to talk through why did we do a special election? That's something that we've talked about in this room. Um, you know, maybe some um, you know questions about why it's special compared to a primary or a general. And I went and met with them and told them our story so they could understand that as well. Um, and you know, trying to work on some potential amendments to make that a little bit um, you know uh, better for schools like Bennington that are growing at a, a, a quick rate. Something to think about if we're going to generals only on those. It's going to be earlier. It's going to be late. I mean, the, with the rate of uh, growth that we have in Gretna and Elkhorn, we're either going to have to look to run bond issues too early because we don't, might not be able to wait for the extra two years, or we're going to do them too late because we've already over we're over capacity now. We're going to start to worry about construction buildings, and so um, hopefully there will be a little bit of. Um, you know, maybe some amendments in there for special districts on class that allow us to have at least a little bit more frequency than beyond every two years. Any other questions on the legislature? Anything else? Um, I believe I believe they should be adjourning in early April, like the fourth or fifth. They typically give themselves a window that they think is vetoed by the governor, they have a chance to come back and um, you know, vote we'll for an open time to be tough governor. And so I'm guessing the days they're going to go to full days here soon, early May, or excuse me, early April, they'll uh, they'll adjourn and die, and then they'll come back uh, within 10 days and do the veto overrides. So get closer. Great. Thank you. All right, that brings us to our unfinished business this evening. And the first action item before the board tonight is for us to discuss consider and take action on proposed changes to the 24-25 school calendar. And as a refresher, we made some changes last month to the 25-26 calendar, and we made some new changes to that. So I think the purpose of this um, evening's discussion and vote is to make similar changes to the calendar for next year. So if you want to give us some highlights on what that is as a reminder. Yeah, it's the main thing. So we're, we kind of manage three calendars at once, the current year, the upcoming year, and two years from now. And so trying to get them all back in alignment uh, based on what we have done throughout the course of this year. And so first change on here was actually something that was approved for the 25-26 calendar. That was separating the high school parent-teacher conferences to Monday and Wednesday, while the other buildings are on Tuesday and Wednesday to try to increase our uh, attendance at the high school. And so this would put next year's line for the approved for two years from now. Uh, the second part is um, giving us a line of what you approved from this year as well, which was the early out on the same day as the Bennington Track Invitational. We utilize our staff uh, to run that. We don't have enough parking um, for what it goes on during the school day, and so we need to um, have the additional parking as well. And so this would add an early staggered dismissal um, on April 22nd to accommodate the track meet. That's been approved for 20. Current year 23 24 and 25 26. We just got to get the middle of the year done on both of those fronts. Those are the two main changes. Are there any questions from the board? All right, I move to approve the 24 25 school calendars presented. 
Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Karen. Any other discussion on a proposed motion? We do have a call roll, please. Tim? Yes. Christy? Yes. Kara? Yes. Steve? Yes. Allison? Yes. Motion passes. The next item before the board is our new business this evening related to some general local agreements related to the Morgan Bridge subdivision that was approved back in July 22. Closing is coming up, and there are some general local agreements that need to be um, approved by the board for closing to take place. Do you want to highlight a couple items for the board on those? Yeah, so as Allison mentioned, uh, this was approved in 2022. Part of that purchase agreement that was approved said that we would enter into local agreements um, to uh, go for the development of the SIV and then also the roads that would go into it. And so this is bringing that to you guys. Now, we first discussed this, I think it was in October, November, I can't really remember. I kind of went through all the what was approved and then what was upcoming within these as well. And so I tried to outline those so you can see where we're at a few months later and how those have come together. Uh, the first one we're talking about is the um, interlocal with SID 2 or 623, so that's within Morgan Ridge. Uh, we have two expenses that come with that. The first is for special assessments. Um, and then the second one is for the general obligation of the in lieu of ad valorem. Um, the current uh, estimate or what is actually within the interlocal agreement the special assessments made two hundred sixty-one thousand five hundred and ninety-six dollars. The general obligation would be six hundred twenty-three thousand two hundred dollars. And so, in comparison, those two together, when we talked about this in uh, October and November, was nine hundred and twenty thousand. Where they're within the actual your local agreements, would be eight hundred eighty-four thousand seven hundred ninety-six. And so, these are about just over thirty-five thousand dollars under budget compared to what we discussed a few a few months ago. Um, essentially, what those do is allow them to um, do the dirt, or excuse me, um, yeah, the, the special session, yeah, in general conversations. Yep. Questions on that and your local agreement? No, we've talked about this a couple times. I just want to make sure folks have any time to ask any additional questions on the interval programs that are now prepared. So, when I'm looking at the actual contract, it looks like total cost is 20 million. Dollars roughly twenty million seven hundred thousand seven hundred description four cost of estimate of public infrastructure. Uh, you're in the actual, and this is um, and then, and then the, the, the general yeah. obligation yeah. is ours, right? The general obligation yes. is eight million is ours. Not a eight portion. A portion of the general obligation. Our portion of the general obligation is uh, six hundred twenty-three and two hundred. Where does that say that in the contract? Get the right page. So below it says district school district's cost share for the public improvements, and then it gives uh, number five right below the table. I think you're looking at. Yep. And this is in draft form. That's what uh, we. I think we're all good. We've got. All the different attorneys that have just got to come back and say yes, give you the final. Uh, um, uh, we're okay with it on all in. So it is still in draft form, which is why the language is as it is, but we don't anticipate any changes. We just have not heard back yet um, to totally finalize it. So we are 7% of the totals. Must be the percentage that they were they used at the time. They were talking about speaking. Okay. So the 884 is worst case scenario. That's, that's us. We're not It'll be done. Yeah, that'll be it. Worst case scenario, yes. Yep. Any other questions? Here's the proposed motion. It's a full paragraph, so someone can get that if you need I'll read it. <laughs> I move that the Board of Education of this school district approves and authorizes execution of the interlocal cooperation agreement with Sanitary and Improvement District Number 623, Douglas County, Nebraska, relating to the design, construction, and payment of certain proposed public infrastructure improvements on and adjacent to a new school property generally located in the Morgan Ridge subdivision near about 156th Street in Ringwood Road. Such agreement in the form on file with official PPS records and as presented at this meeting or with such changes as are deemed necessary and in the best interest of PPS and approved by the board president or superintendent of schools. Thank you, Christine. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Tim. 
Any further discussion before we vote? You know, so I jumped on the second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we call the roll? Kara? Yes. Steve? Yes. Allison? Yes. Tim? Yes. Christy? Yes. Motion passes. Um, next item is the second interlocal agreement. Do you want to highlight a couple of items from that? Yeah, so this would be uh, with ourselves, uh, Douglas County, SID 623, SID 633, and the Tapio, Missouri and River NRD. And so this would be for the road that would connect 156, uh, 168. So it would be the extension of Rainwood Road as it is now to continue straight forward and go all the way across. Um, and uh, again, this is a condition of the uh, purchase agreement that we would enter into uh, in a local with them. They have completed, um, this is for two thirds of that road. And so I want to be clear on this. That road, as a, if you think about 156 to 168, this would be an interlocal for all of us, but all the costs that we're talking about are for two thirds of the road. The final third of the road is where it gets to that dam site. And all that this interlocal agrees us to is that we will be a part of those discussions. Not actual any costs associated with it. We haven't got that far. Nobody knows what's out there as far as what that is even going to cost. Um, and so this is the first two thirds that would go past these two um, subdivisions, these two SIDs, get to the dam site and stop. And so that's where all these costs are going to. Um, and so uh, when we talked about this earlier, or the way that this is um, played out, is 320,226 for the roadway grading. And then 171, 138 for the paving. When we talked about this in October and November, whichever month it was, they originally estimated $750,000 for these two line items. Um, as of uh, the writing of the end local, it's 498.72. And so we are currently $259,128 under budget compared to what we anticipated earlier in the year. Again, for two thirds of that project. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry. So I'm looking to the agreement on that. Is that under section five? I don't see where we're going to discuss that. We're giving a quiz on these like 13 page Which page is that right? Yeah, where it's got the dollar amount in the phone. Yeah, the I don't see those numbers at all. It's got uh, all construction and engineering costs for improvements shall be paid as follows. And so it lists out the Douglas County SID 623 and SID 633, but then it's called the school district. I was going, uh, my numbers came directly off of somebody from Derek Aldridge, so I got to find it within the contract. <clears throat> Yeah, I was looking. Yeah, but it's a C. Great question. Yeah, I didn't get the answer. I'm trying to say it just says it's attached, but I don't know the question. Yeah, I didn't get it attached. I had Derek Aldridge send me a direct summary of like, tell me exactly what it's going to cost, what, or what it costs within the contract as it is, which is how. Um, all of these numbers have been put together. So I'm assuming it says that percentage in there, or maybe that's the attachment that's left. So for approving things, right, and something changes, then it comes back to the board. Mm -hmm. So this would give the ability, um, if the, there's nothing, or there's something that's in the best interest of DPS, it would be if you approve it, Allison would have the ability to uh, sign it. Obviously, if there was any the huge change or whatever we would bring back to the board as well. Right. And what is that size major range? Like we're talking hundred thousand, fifty thousand? 
when you said that. I know you guys want. I feel confident in the numbers. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind. Numbers. So I feel really, yeah. And we have a public record of what we discussed as to what the costs are during mm -hmm. this meeting. And so if it's anything other than that, then it would be deemed not necessary. So I'm going to go out and add a motion if that's right. Okay. No issue with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just. Any other questions on the local agreement? Okay, I wonder if we can go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that closing is on April 1. And so we'll have the land and the grading that was previously approved on April 1. And so that will be in your invoice report at the next meeting. Approval. There will be some closing costs in there beyond that, you know, a little bit beyond what we had talked about before. But uh, I tried to put it on this one, and we can't do that. It's part of our agreement and the wire transfer, so it's got to be after the fact. So it'll be in your April packet. All right, there is a motion. Yeah, all right. I have practice. I move that the Board of Education of this school district approves and authorizes execution of the interlocal cooperation agreement with Douglas County, Nebraska Sanitarian Improvement District, number 623 of Douglas County, Nebraska. Oh, sorry, see, I'm not doing so. Well. No, I say it again. Okay. Oh, they get messed up. Douglas County, Nebraska Sanitary Improvement District 633 of Douglas County, Nebraska, and Tapio, Missouri River Natural Resources District. Relating to the design, construction, and payment of certain proposed public infrastructure improvements on and to Rainwood Road between 166 and 156. Is that supposed to be 168? Yes. I copy paste this though. Okay. Or is that because it's the two thirds that it's 166? Probably two thirds. I copy and paste it from the attorney. I have no idea. 166 <laughs> and 156 streets, which is and adjacent to a new school property generally located in Morgan, Morgan Ridge subdivision near about 156th Street and Rainwood Road. Such agreement in the form of file with official BPS records and is presented at this meeting or with such changes as are deemed necessary and in the best interest of BPS and approved by the <coughs> board president or superintendent of schools. Any other questions? I'll second. Thank you. Don't be called so vote. Kara? Yes. Steve? Yes. Allison? Yes. Tim? Yes. Christy? Yes. Motion passes. And I believe the only other item this evening is um, a couple reminders about our upcoming meetings. So our next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be at 6 o'clock on April 8th here in the district office. Um, we do have a curriculum and Americanism meeting on today. Oh, already happened. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then obviously tomorrow in our final election results. So March 12th, big date for our district. And with no further business, I move to adjourn the meeting. Joe, do you want to call the roll? Yes. Yes. Allison? Yes. Allison? Yes. Yes. Meeting is adjourned. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>